Hello again and good afternoon everybody and thank you all for connecting again uh, to this webinar. Uh, just a little reminder, uh, my name is Paul Sewell and I'm a founding member of the New Reality Magazine, which is an internationalist platform of progressive ideas, bilingual digital magazine in Spanish and English that is willing to construct a new narrative of revolutionary and creative productive forces. Uh, we'd kindly like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Um, our Facebook page um, is, uh, one second, find it there, Revista Nueva Realidad. And we're also streaming live on there today. And also we are streaming live um, with Michael uh, Roberts' blogspot as well. Um, so we did the first part of the, of the webinar earlier on today. Uh, very interesting with Michael. And also we have Professor Stavros Mavrudes on there as well. Um, and you can catch that if you missed it the first time. Uh, that is, again, on our Facebook page and also on Michael's Facebook page as well. And we'll be posting that on YouTube after we finish this webinar. Um, coming up in this second part, we'll be having hearing again from Michael. And also later on in the second half, we'll be uh, hearing from Professor Camilla uh, Royal as well. She'll be also speaking to us. So very much looking forward to that. And Michael, I believe you just come back from a trip to Russia. How was that? Well, yes, I just flew there and back within the last hour or so. It was an amazing virtual trip. Um, the University of Moscow has put on a two-day forum on Ingalls um, yesterday and today and uh, have read a battery of international and Russian speakers and academics uh, who presented all sorts of different angles on Ingalls' contribution to historical materialism and so on. But I'm glad to say that not many contributions on political contribution from Ingalls on political economy, so that was my angle, of course, as you now realize. Um, uh, so that gave me an opportunity to present a few things there, which um, hopefully will increase the debate around the world internationally. That's fantastic. Uh, it's good to know that um, Engels is being recognized in, a, in such a way. So we'll do the first part yes, as we did. This. That Marxism in Russia is not dead. At least. Yes, it's good yeah. to know. <laughs> um, so we're going to do the second part of the webinar as we did the first. We'll hear from yourself and Camilla and then we'll take some questions uh, for both of you uh, at the end. So uh, the stage is yours, Michael. Yes, well, thanks, Paul. What I want to do in the second session is to deal with the contribution that Engels made to Marxist political economy particularly after Marx's death in 1883, because Engels carries on for another 12 years in uh, contributing towards the development of Marxism and also for the development of socialist organizations and the labor movement internationally, particularly in Europe. Um, and in the first session, I dealt with some of the key ideas that Engels brought up um, before Marx on the question of a critique of political economy and also an analysis of capitalism in his two major works then, the uh, critique, an outline of the critique of political economy and also the condition of the working class in England. But now I wanna move on to this period after Marx's death uh, and Engels' contribution there, which in some ways is more, uh, uh, um, how can I put it, controversial uh, amongst uh, Marxists after, uh, in, these la in this last hundred years or so uh, since um, he wrote these works. So I'm just going to share again a few more screen slides with you guys, um, if I can get the right one. Yep. So I call it the Moscow University, as you can see, I've done it before, but basically it's the same thing. Um, and just want to remind guys that um, on the left-hand screen here, you can see Engels at 22 when he wrote those early works, which uh, uh, before Marx uh, took uh, Marx's economics and political economy forward. And in the period uh, near Marx's death and afterwards when he was a mature, mature man. I always like to show photographs of uh, these of people so that they're not just regarded as being old, but they did have a youthful period as well. And of course, Engels, was in particular that case. But after 1850, when both Engels and Marx were exiled into England after the failure of the revolutions of 1848-49, um, Engels was exiled and came actually directly back to his um, father's cotton mill factory in Manchester to work and earn a living, uh, using that money partly to fund Marx's studies of economics and uh, uh, Marxist ideas, uh, 
culminating in capital in 1867 uh, over that period. So from 1850 to 1870, Engels was locked up in Manchester, not doing any great major works, but still contributing significantly to Marx's articles and ideas that he was working on, particularly articles uh, of journalistic nature that Marx looked to make money out of. Many of the articles that Marx wrote were actually written by Engels and just endorsed by Marx in order to make some money with uh, newspapers and other journals internationally. But in 1870, he retires and moves back to London to renew his close collaboration with Marx on ideas. And in, in the 1880s, just after Marx's death, he writes a paper in Neue Zeit in which he looks back at what happened when he first wrote his earlier works in 1845 and what the situation was in 1885. And also he begins the process of editing Marx's capital volume, what can turn out to be volumes two and three of capital to add to volume one. And in doing so, not only editing, but also looked at uh, writing a preface on both of those uh, volumes in order to explain developments since Marx uh, put down those manuscripts and since the period of the 1848 revolution. So he yeah, makes a lot of contributions in this area. And so I'm gonna quickly run through some of these. And the most important thing was Ed Engel's detailed and uh, incessant attempt to edit all of Marx's manuscripts, very difficult to read. Uh, it's rumored that he actually had to rub cocaine in his eyes to properly uh, read them because he had short sighted uh, um, symptoms and editing that Marx's script was very difficult. Only he and Marx's daughter Eleanor could actually read this after his wife Jenny died. So they began the edit, uh, Engels began the edit of Capital. And this has become quite controversial because it is claimed by Western Marxists now, particularly since the uh, mega studies by scholars in Germany of the basic manuscripts of Marx have been done, that Engels in editing volume three of Capital misunderstood and even distorted Marx's law of profitability, making it much more important than Marx ever intended. So in particular, these critics attack Engels for the chapters 13 to 15 in volume three of Capital. Not only that, but this, in particular this, this area to say that as uh, Stavros Mavridias, the professor from Pantheon University Athens was presented in the first session, in order to, dis the Engels distortion of these uh, three chapters has led to um, uh, an overemphasis on Marx's law of profitability of being relevant to crises and to Marx's theory. Michael Heinrich in particular uh, considered that Engel's edition of volume three was so bad that it was not in, in any way a genuine presentation of Marxist ideas. Indeed, worse than that, Marx really no longer believed in this law of the downward trend of profit rates and that Engels by including this in, in capital volume three was completely contradicting Marx's own personal views. Yet if we look in the preface of volume three, Engels notes that he spent some that Marx spent some considerable time looking at the relationship between the rate of profit and the rate of surplus value, key categories in Marx's analysis of, of capitalism in the 1870s, well after the uh, period that Heinrich says he no longer was interested. That seems to contradict his Heinrich's claim that he'd given up on the law. And indeed, remember, Engels and Marx were now from 1870 up to Marx's death, seeing each other nearly every day talking at length about whatever in the pub and elsewhere. And if Marx had dropped the tendency of the rate of profit to fall as a theory, as a law that he'd written about in Grundriss in the 1850s and later in the manuscripts, uh, then he surely would have told Engels. Engels would have noted that fact. And we're, Engels actually hadn't even seen the Grundrisse that Marx had written in 1857-8, but he still recognized that the three chapters in volume three is analyzing and explaining the law of the tendency of rate of profit to fall should be included. That demonstrates to me there was no contradiction here or misrepresentation. Um, but also in volume three, a very important thing is Engels added to volume three his own material. This is something that people aren't always aware of, but in particular there's a section on the turnover of capital. 
He points out that, there, as Marx explains in uh, the chapter 14, there are a number of counteracting factors to the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. I won't list them now, uh, but it's well, you've only got to read those three chapters, they're not long, and it provides the kernel of everything to understand about uh, the theory of crisis from the point of view of Marxism. But uh, Engels adds something else as an extra counter factor to the tendency of the profit to fall, namely that if capitals can turn over capital and uh, production at a faster rate, then they're going to get more value in the same time than they otherwise would be. So any increase in the turnover of value will increase the rate of surplus value created and therefore uh, reduce the effect of a falling rate of profit. And we can argue in the 21st century, a speedier turnover of time and motion into demand and delivery has reduced the cost of circulating capital and increased production relative to the amount of fixed capital. So as Engel says, the direct effect of a reduced period of turnover on the production of surplus value and consequently of profit consists in an increased efficiency imparted thereby to the variable portion of capital, therefore will tend to counteract the fall in the rate of profit. And if you look at the right-hand graph here, here's a measure uh, by some Marxist economists empirically of the annual turnover of US circulating capital since the 1960s. And you can see it was capital got turned over at six times every year. That, that increased dramatically up to 10 or 11 times in the 21st century. That's a powerful factor in trying to counteract the fall in the rate of profit. And we can see that it particularly takes place from the 1980s, which is exactly when we do see a recovery in the rate of profit. Engels also, uh, nevertheless, was very concerned to make sure that the law of profitability was seen as a major part of Marx's theory of crisis. As he said, the tendency of the profit rate to fall of society progresses is Marx's explanation makes discovery of that as one of the great triumphs over all previous proof of economy, and he considered an essential feature of Marx's analysis. And of course, Marx's analysis is absolutely correct. We can see here from the UK period of the 19th century, in the UK, the rate of profit, you can see the boom period 1855 up until 1870, and then a sharp drop in the rate of profit, and it was published anti during here, and then he publishes volumes two and three, right at the bottom of a severe decline in the rate of profit and a major collapse in uh, growth of capitalist production and investment, which eventually led to some minimal recovery. And that's the point here that Engels notes alongside this fall in the rate of profit, exactly that we now enter the period, not just of cycles of boom and slump from the 1870s onwards, he argues, but a chronic state of stagnation in all dominant branches of industry. So that it's no longer a boom and a slump with prosperity coming up, but it's a dull depression with, which we've been living in for nearly 10 years, he says in 1886, looking back. The decennial cycle of stagnation, prosperity, overproduction and crisis has given away to a slow despond of permanent and chronic depression. In my view, um, this is exactly the picture we've had really in the 21st century since the end of the Great Recession, slow down, in production, investment, and in, and in income standards. So as a result, we're in a swarm of, uh, of chronic depression, which is capitalism is finding very difficult to get out. In the uh, long depression of the late 19th century, which most scholars now recognize, you can see the sharp difference in the level of pr industrial production growth compared to the boom period of 1850-1870 in the major economies. So Engels' observation of this depression is borne out by the facts. Now Engels, in, he rejected the idea that underconsumption is the cause of crisis. In his book, Anti-During, written with Marx's participation and involvement, he took on Dr. Eugen During, who was a major social democratic scholar at the time, who argued that crises were caused by the lack of demand from workers who didn't have enough money to buy the goods the capitalists produce. This simple underconsumption theory of, of crises, Engels argued against. He said masses are always in an underconsumption position. They're always being forced down to the minimum uh, level of wages that will survive, as it, we pointed out in the first session. It's a necessary condition of all forms of society. 
So therefore, it doesn't explain the nature of the boom and slump and crisis we get in capitalism because it's a product of a class society. Really. So the underconsumption of masses is a pre prerequisite condition of crisis and plays a role, but it tells us just as little as why crises exist today is why they do not exist before. Engels prefers a theory of crisis based on overproduction. That is overproduction of commodities as a result of the over accumulation of capital, the means of production and labor, relative to profit created and appropriated. He particularly quotes that words of Marx, which is to say that even under the extreme conditions assumed by us, this absolute overproduction of capital is not absolute overproduction, but absolute overproduction of the means of production, that is the machinery and raw materials, and it's overproduction of means of production only insofar as the latter serve as capital. In other words, relative to profitability is the key um, cause of crises. One of the big features that Engels presents, uh, which uh, is now very relevant to modern economic crises and conditions, is the concept of fictitious capital. Back in 1844, in the condition of the working class in England, he anticipates by Marx by saying, Speculation in the financial sector, buying and selling of bonds and stocks and shares and other financial assets uh, through borrowing on credit is actually a, a phenomenon which uh, uh, creates a multiplies of disorder and uh, a crisis in society. A lot of investors are no longer investing in productive activity, they're investing in trading in money. This becomes separate from trading in commodities and for production in general, and it starts to develop its own laws, its own power. Financial crises uh, feed upon itself as a result of the development of what is called fictitious capital. In other words, the investment in what appears to be capital, bonds and shares, is quite often fictitious because it's not really related to the real values being produced by workers in production, uh, the value and surplus value there. And in the end, you cannot separate that from the production process and the exploitation of workers in the production process, as Engels uh, says. You know, exchange will be eventually connected to production and the, the fictitious capital will turn out to be fictitious depending on what's happening in the production process. Another key aspect which uh, Camilla is going to deal with, so I won't to spend too much time on this, is Engels' uh, important role of explaining the relationship between humanity and nature under capitalism. He points out, we can see it now in the middle of this COVID, capitalism's drive to industrialize agriculture, we usurp the remaining wilderness, has led to nature striking back with pathogens that no, for which we have no immunity and have now begun to food through the food chain to us and cause uh, these new pandemics like COVID-19. Just in the same way as when the conquistadores from Europe arrived in the 16th century, they wiped out 90% of the American Native Americans, not by uh, military activity mostly, but in fact by the diseases they brought with them, with, for which Native Americans had no immunity. And so Engel says that reminds us that we don't rule over nature like a conqueror, like a, like a foreign people as the conquistadores did, something standing outside nature, that we're part of nature. And that means we must learn to understand the laws of nature and how we relate to that. He says, we're learning more. We're learning remote consequences of our interference in the course of nature. But, and we need to learn the contradictions between nature and humanity and how we can deal with it. He says humans can work in harmony with us and part of nature, as long as they have greater knowledge of the consequences of their human action. In his collection of uh, papers which he put together as the dialectics of nature, he says that we're learning by crude experience, experience what this means, the remote and social effects of our productive activity. But he goes on to say, it's not just a question of science. It's not just a question of learning more about pathogens, to say. Science is not enough. We need to carry out a complete revolution in our hitherto um, existing mode of production, and with it, a whole contemporary social order. So it was by no means some sort of positivist scientific determinist, as he's often concluded, uh, accused of. In fact, his view on the relationship with humanity and nature is a revolutionary one, that is a dialectical one, the process of changing the mode of production 
is absolutely essential for to end the rift between nature and humanity. A couple of other points to finish. After, uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, Engels looked at the question of how the depression had led to a collapse in the strength of British capitalist power in world trade and manufacturing. The hegemonic position that Britain held in the middle of the 19th century began to disappear. You can see on the left hand point here that it's the maximum share of world trade, of world manufacturing output to be more exact, for the UK peaked around the end of the 1870s and then began to decline relatively as America and as Germany began to pick up. This is particularly during the, the Long Depression that, that England's monopoly of the world market was shattered by the participation of France, Germany, above all of America in world trade. A new form of evening out appears to come into operation, says England. This is a lesson for us now. The US is in a similar position where its position relatively is beginning to decline against rival powers. If, to some extent, Japan in the 1970s, Europe a bit, but the main force, of course, is the new 21st century economic rival, Japan, which is now increasing the intensity of the struggle on trade and technology between these two powers who will rule, who will have the hegemonic position in the 21st century. But it was also says the result of this competition between these national powers towards the end of the 19th century, bred a systematic development of armaments race, which is clearly the imperialist powers are gonna settle the issue of who controls the world's uh, surplus value and value through world war. And he made this very, powerful prediction that a world war was on the agenda, a world war moreover of an extent and violence hitherto unimagined. Eight to 10 million soldiers would be at each other's throats. And in the process, they will strip Europe bare than a swarm of locusts. And the war will cause, quotes, the collapse of the old states and their conventional political wisdom to the point where crowns will roll into the gutters by the dozen and no one will be able to pick them up, opening up the opportunities for proletarian revolution. As a result of that depression, the limited recovery we went to the major imperialist war as we know in 1914. Engels said and predicted that whichever side England back would win, that America would merge with victorious from the war and assume the hegemonic position in the 20th century, how right he was. But he looked out of the war for revolutions in France and Germany, probably the, the weakest nations out of this war, the, the losers, uh, as a consequence. The only hope, he said, of stopping a long war was if the Russian people came out of the war, overthrew the Tsar and made a revolutionary peace. Well, exactly, that's exactly what happened in 1917 and in some ways brought the war quickly to an end as the Russian revolution began. And he made comments in discussions with uh, Russian revolutions on the question of, Russia, of a revolution in Russia. He said, the successful transition transition to communism in Russia, based on commune, on communal ownership, will require a sudden change of direction in Western Europe. The overthrow of the Tsarist regime, a requirement for progress by the peasantry, could encourage or would encourage proletarian revolution in the West, in turn, as a necessary condition for the socialist transformation in Russia. Again, amazingly uh, powerful presentation of the international nature of what is often called the permanent revolution, the need to move the revolution from one country to another in order to choose it successfully in football. Finally, I want to make a point about revolution reform. In the early 1890s, the German Social Democratic Party became a mass party and it started to develop its programmatic theses for how that mass party was going to achieve socialism. It was led by people like Edward Bernstein, a very close friend of Engels, and Karl Kautsky. They argued that, yes, we're in favor of uh, uh, socialism, and common ownership, democratic control, and all the rest of it, but we've got to recognize that is only going to happen through a gradual process in Parliament. And the first task is really to make gains for the workers through trade unions, through uh, parliamentary legislation, and so on. And Engels argued against that view. So this is reducing a uh, revolutionary perspective we should have to one of reformist acceptance, acceptance of capitalism. And I just quote in the black there, you can see, which I think sums up the question of how you pose the question between revolution and reform in just one paragraph. 
As Engels said, our program is purely a socialist one. Our first crank is the socialization of all the means and instruments of production. Still, we accept anything which any government may give us, but only as a payment on account and for which we offer no thanks. And exactly that is it. That is the way we have to pose these questions when we're looking at whether we're in favor of reform or revolution. It's not an either or, it's a question of the combination, but in the way I think that Engels poses that question. Thank you, Paul. Fantastic, Michael. Thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, extremely interesting stuff. I feel like I'm learning a lot myself and hopefully we'll get some fantastic questions there for you. Uh, for later on. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so on either one of our Facebook pages, either Revista Nueva Realidad Facebook page, or also Michael Roberts' blog on his uh, Facebook page. We'll be going through those a little bit later, and we'll be coming back to Michael uh, with some questions towards the end. Uh, now I'm going to introduce our second uh, panellist or talker for today. Uh, it's Professor Camilla Royal, and she teaches at King's College London and the LSE. She's the author of A Rebel's Guide to Engels and Engels as an Ecologist. In Engels in the 21st century, a re-examination from a critical perspective. Uh, she's a socialist environmental geographer and her work has been published in Antipode International Socialism and the Routledge Collections. Uh, as deputy editor of International Socialism, she organised and spoke at a conference in Central Non Marxism and Nature with Ted Benton and Ian Angus included amongst the speakers. Uh, for more information, we can recommend that you should visit her website, which is camillaroyal.com. So Camilla, how are you today? Um I'm good, thanks. Um, you promoted me. I'm not a professor just yet. But, oh, uh, okay. Well, maybe you will be soon, Chris. It's inevitable, <laughs> I think. Hopefully sooner rather than later, thank you. <laughs> um, so Camilla, um, over to you then. Great, thanks for that. Um, so I'm going to try and talk about uh, angles and the dialectics of nature and try to kind of squeeze it into 20 minutes. So, um, I mean, I'll start the situation that we're in it's a time of multiple and connected ecological crises as Michael Roberts um, mentioned in his own talk. Uh, we have the COVID pandemic, um, a virus that originated in bats probably but has been able to transfer to humans due to the destruction of forest areas uh, for plantations and the way in which animals have been commodified um, in agriculture in the interests of profit climate change continues, it hasn't gone away, um, even with the, the pandemic and the lockdowns. And, you know, we have new disasters every year, you know, every September, there are you know, more hurricanes in the Western Hemisphere. And, you know, as it goes towards, um, you know, summer in Australia, we're seeing reports of uh, more bushfires. Again, this year, it seems like this is going to be the reality for the next little while. And, um, you know, if Governments were really serious about keeping uh, temperatures rises within one and a half degrees Celsius, the kind of aspirational target of the Paris Conference in 2015. You know, they'd need to keep, you'd an almost complete shutdown of the fossil fuel industry, really. You'd need to keep vast amounts of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground and not exploit them and not burn them. Um, it's looking very unlikely that they'll manage to coordinate and do that. Um, but um, as well as ecological crises, we've also seen the growth of mass movements over climate change and over biodiversity over the past few years. Climate strikes of school students, Extinction Rebellion, Canadian First Nations, other Indigenous groups taking direct action over oil pipelines and other movements around the world taking direct action. And often for these movements, um, they have quite radical ideas. I think the idea that and the slogan that we need system change, not climate change, kind of fits with people's understanding increasingly. So in this context, a number of, of scholars have made productive use of Marx's writings, um, particularly his references to metabolism and rifts in the, in the social natural metabolism um, that he makes in Capital. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, what about Engels on nature? Um, and I will mention two works, really, The Condition of the Working Class in England, which he wrote in 1844, and I'll try and talk more about the dialectics of nature. So um, in terms of the condition of the working class, um, people might have heard me speak more about this at historical materialism a couple of weeks ago, but I'll just um, 
summarise it quickly, he's talking about situation in the mid 19th century where you had mass migration of people into the cities. So according to Engels' own data, the population of Lancashire increased by 10 times in 80 years. Um, he saw the creation of an industrial working class, people moving into the cities and becoming part of a working class and you know, working in factories rather than in their own homes. Because um, this was bound up with a, tradition, with a transition towards the use of the fossil fuel, um, primarily the burning of coal to fuel all, all those, um, those mills and things. And you know, the 19th century ruling class wouldn't have known the effect that this would have on climate change. Um, they would have predicted that necessarily, but they would have been aware of the health impacts that this was having for ordinary people. And Engels yeah, describes these um, impacts in terms of water and air pollution and in terms of the health impacts on working class people at numerous points within his book. So he talks about the foul smell of the coal smoke, um, streets that are in his words, rough, dirty, filled with vegetable and animal refuse, with sewers or gutters, but supplied without sewers or gutters, sorry, but supplied with foul, stagnant pools instead. The atmosphere within the factories is damp and warm, and usually warmer than is necessary. And the ventilation is not very good, um, impure, heavy, deficient in oxygen, filled with dust and the smell of the machine oil, which almost as everywhere smears the floor, sinks into it, and becomes rancid. You know, he talks about rivers as well. You know. These, um, you know, rivers like the Irk in Manchester, where he was living, that, you know, rather than being a sort of fast flowing river, it's sluggish and it's just completely full of, um, you know, refuse and um, gross um, pollution. Um, he talks about the ruling class at the time committing social murder. Um, yeah, he followed the working class movement of his day in using that term social murder to describe how the bosses were putting people in a situation, creating an environment in which they cannot hope to possibly lead healthy lives. Um, he also refer talked about pandemics as well, actually. Uh, he described how the relations created by human activity had also created an ecological niche, um, an environment in which harmful pathogens would thrive. Um, the most terrifying sort of disease outbreaks in his day were not co coronaviruses, they were things like cholera and typhus but I think it's nevertheless very relevant how he talks about how people's housing conditions had um, and people's working conditions meant that it was you know almost inevitable that these diseases would would spread among people. Um, he wasn't aware of things like the germ theory of disease writing in the 1840s that would come later on when, when um, epidemiologists um, you know established the germ theory of disease you know Engels would have you know, thought like everyone did at the time that diseases were spread by miasma, like so, you know, a kind of uh, unhealthy bad air that was spreading these diseases like cholera. Um, but his ideas are nevertheless still relevant. And he did adopt the, the germ theory of the disease um, later on. And um, so I think his kind of ideas is, and his writings are strikingly contemporary. You know, you look at Jakarta after the flooding um, last January and the descriptions of people's lives there. Um, look at the descriptions of um, air pollution in, in Delhi every year or you know, flooding in, um, in other parts of the world, floods in, in Karachi this year. You know, the conditions that people are living in seem very, very similar sadly to what Engels was describing in 19th century Britain. Um, his key kind of, um, insight in this book, I think, is that struggles of workers over you know, social struggles over better wages and better working conditions are not distinct from struggles over environmental relations. Um, you know, environmentalism isn't just about protecting wilderness areas and protecting um, rural areas and um, saving species. It's also about what happens in cities and about the um, struggles in work of workers that often take place within urban environments increasingly these days, you know, these are no less environmental struggles. Um, so if you want to read one thing on Engels and ecology, um, the condition of the working class in England, I would say read, read that one. Um, but people have also started to talk about the dialectics of nature and debate this as well recently. So I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, so as Michael said, dialectics of nature, it was, 
Engels is unpublished notes um, that he started working on in 1873, um, started to put together some of his research on science and nature. He was engaged in all these kind of debates among scientists that were happening in Manchester and other places within Britain at the time. Um, it took 10 years compiling it and then obviously um, 1883 Karl Marx died and um, Engels had to put aside the dialectics of nature and focus on other works, including um, works on anthropology and the family, but also the um, huge task of uh, editing capital volumes two and three, um, as, we've, as we've already heard about. So um, I think it's, it's an interesting text because um, a lot of Marxists talk about the uses that science gets put to in society. You know, we can talk about you know, does more money get spent on, um, you know, putting, putting Elon Musk into space? Should it really be spent on developing vaccines for coronavirus? Is, you know, should it be, um, should the money that gets invested in science be put to better use? Um, you know, that's not a bad thing for Marxists to be interested in. But Engels is also interested in debates within science. You know, what are scientists actually researching? What are their ideas? Um, what well, the experiments that they're doing, you know, do Marxists actually have something to say about this as well, a kind of pure science? Uh, and it was, you know, as I said, pretty well informed, um, you know, easily well um, abreast of these ideas enough to take part in these debates, you know, with scientists that he um, that he corresponded with. Um, in the 19th century, what you had as well was a time when kind of mechanistic views within science were being challenged and and um, scientists themselves were starting to recognize that there's, there are kind of processes of historical development within nature. Um, so Charles Darwin you know, is foremost within this. Um, you know, Darwin talked about how species aren't just fixed entities. You know, species can evolve into new species through time um, in a very long gradual process. Um, Lyle, the geologist, is also talking about change through time, um, irreversible what evolutionary change in geology, um, Lyle in um, sorry, Lyle geology, um, dual in physics is also at the same time talking about um, you know energy being conserved and um, you know different forms of energy and energy being converted from one form of energy um, into another, but never disappearing or um, being being reduced in any way, but just um, uh, transferring into new new different forms of, of energy. Um, you can tell I'm not really a, a physicist, my background's more biology. Um, but the dialectics of nature has remained controversial um, ever since. And I think it's quite a, it's an odd idea to get your head around dialectics of nature. You know, can this kind of, you know, it's a kind of Hegelian philosophical system that Marx uses to talk about society and to understand how capitalism works. Can you also apply that and look at what scientists are talking about and you know, make actual um, intuitions into into um, the way that processes in within nature work. Um, I think a lot of scientists would say, um, you know, of course not. The you know, na you know, the politics and you know, I ideology is something that you know doesn't really have a place within science. That's still a pretty common view these these days. That science is just you know, it's just completely objective. They just do do experiments. Um, they don't have any particular philosophical position when they they do their science. Um, I think Engels, a kind of controversial bit of dialectics of nature is probably Engels' three laws of dialectics. Um, so he talks about the interpenetration of opposites, the change from quantity into quality and the negation of the negation. I mean, you know, what does negation of the negation um, even mean. Um, and these are often demonstrated by examples from nature. So in order to kind of explain a shift from quantity into quality, um, you could use the example of what happens when you take, um, when you take water, liquid water, and boil it. Um, so you raise the temperature, gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And when you get to 100 degrees, it goes through a qualitative change, uh, no longer liquid water. It has reached boiling point and it is now steam. So it's a completely different um, 
type of substance with completely different properties. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, fair enough. That is a change from quantity into quality. People also say that um, when a chick catches from an egg, it negates the egg because, you know, the egg no longer exists. Um, chick has replaced it. And then later on, a hen then negates the chick. Um, so the chick no longer exists. It's been transformed into, into a hen. Um, John Bellamy Foster in um, a recent article has some slightly more sophisticated examples from science that are supposed to kind of illustrate some of these um, free laws of dialectics. I think they're useful to a point. Um, I think they can kind of demonstrate the type of philosophy that dialectics is. Um, but I think if they're taken just too literally, it can, it makes everything way too simplistic. Um, Ian Birchall has this quote that making a revolution is far more complex than making a cup of tea or even breeding chickens. And, you know, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, it is, you know, nature is not really, um, it's not possible to, to distill it down to just three laws. Um, furthermore, uh, the laws can be taken to imply a kind of predetermined course that nature should have to follow. And this has been particularly contentious, this kind of negation of the negation idea could be taken to mean that as an inevitable course of events, um, you know, it could be taken to mean that proletarian revolution is inevitable under capitalism. Um, you know, certainly capitalism creates the conditions for proletarian re revolution. It creates the conditions for people to rise up and overthrow it and um, negate it. Um, but, you know, I don't think this is a a guaranteed and I don't think it's kind of fundamental to the way the world works. Um, it can, and also people have criticised these laws because they say that there are no subjective processes in within nature that, um, you know, what Engels seems to be talking about when he talks about laws of nature is a kind of nature that you observe from the outside um, that humans have no, no role in. They're you know, the role of the human observer is just to just to watch what happens in nature and nature is seen as distinct from society with no um, objective processes in this. This is kind of um, Georg Lukács' contention um, in, uh, in his work. Um, and there's a lot of debate you could go into in this. I won't have time to talk about it because Lukács also changes his own mind. But this is, you know, a valid kind of criticism. So having said all that, is there anything good in the dialectics of nature? Is there anything that we would defend? Um, I think there are, yeah, despite the kind of some of my uh, contentions about it. And I think, you know, you have to bear in mind it was never meant for publication. He never finished it off and published it. It was only kind of published much later in the 20th century by the sort of communist party figures over it in Russia. And um, they will have put their own spin on it. I'm sure in the editing it might not have been what Engels actually intended intended I don't think it was um, but I think what is useful in it is that um, I think what we can take from dialectics of nature is this idea that both society and nature are fundamentally uh, dynamic rather than static that processes of constant change are as relevant to nature as they are to society and you know indeed they should you know, because there isn't really a distinction between nature and society. You know, as Michael has rightly said, society is part of nature. So you would expect that some of the same processes to exist um, in both. Um, change is a default state of the universe. It's stasis and it's stasis that is unusual and requires explanation. So, and as Engels himself, I think Engels himself comes to this kind of conclusion in um, Ludwig Feuerbach and the end of classical German philosophy, he says that the world is not to be comprehended as a complex of ready-made things, but as a complex of processes in which the things go through an uninterrupted change of coming into being and passing away. So this is a philosophy which is all about not accepting the way that the way things are at the moment is the way that they'll always be. Everything has come from something and everything is going somewhere else. Um, you know, that's kind of how, how the world works. Um, Khan Kangal, um, again, I won't go into it in detail, but he's also draws on Engels' ideas about emergence. So nature as a differentiated unity, 
were properties at one level that cannot be understood purely with reference to what happens at lower levels. So you can't understand biology just purely by saying, by explaining it in terms of chemistry. And you can't explain chemistry just purely by explaining it in terms of physics. You know, each new kind of um, level of analysis have, has its own properties um, that emerge from what happens at, at um, a more fundamental level. We can't be reduced to it. Um, I also think that Engels on the part played by labour in the transition from ape to man is the best bit. And that is kind of the really useful part of dialectics of nature. Um, he asserts here one of the key premises of premises of historical materialism that our ability to labour is what makes us human. So human labour is what facilitated humans evolution from our ancestors. So whereas Darwin says that um, you know, it was the human brain that developed first, and this led to us being intelligent enough to be able to develop tool use. Engels says it's actually the other way around, um, that we learnt to walk upright, and that left our hands free to develop the use of tools. And this process, in turn, um, meant that we developed larger brains and more sophisticated neural ability. Um, you know, archaeological evidences since um, suggested that Engels was actually correct on this point, which is quite quite something um, for someone who was um, kind of, you know, a self-taught um, person with an interest in science and auto autodidact. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, anthropologist, has said that Engels provided us with a brilliant expose of um, a theory of human evolution with the role of human labour at its heart. So um, I've talked for quite a while, but I'll sort of conclude on this. This is about humans and other animals acting on the world and changing and adapting the world around us. Um, that world also acts back upon us and drives our own evolution. So both humans and you know, all other species are the subjects of evolution and also the objects of evolution. Um, you know, we play an active role in evolutionary processes, uh, but unlike the changes that other species make to their immediate environment, no means the case um so yeah i will i will end it on on that point okay thanks very much camilla um we will now be taking some questions um for the both of you um so i think the first one is actually for you camilla although michael you also may have some input on this one um so the first question was from luke in manchester who got in touch to say would you consider engels to be one of the first environmentalists of the industrial age is that a fair comment to make? So I'll tell it to either one of you who wants to answer. That's for Camilla, maybe. Camilla? Um, yeah, I think he was one of the first environmentalists of the industrial age. Um, I will, I'll put some, some links actually, I forgot to put it to things that people can, can read, but I would definitely recommend um, John Bellamy Foster's most recent book, um, The Return of Nature, where he talks about Engels's contribution to environmental thought. Um, it, it, it's, you know, obviously it was the 19th century. We know a lot more now than we did back then um, about, you know, including about climate change. Although Marx and Engels were aware of um, localized climate change. They were aware that if you cut too many trees down in a local area, that does have an effect on the climate, but and they were, were aware of Tyndall's work, uh, which started to raise the issue that if you put too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's going to heat up the planet on a global scale. They didn't uh, understand um, climate change to the extent that we understand it now. It's not, you know, the biggest political, it, was, it wasn't at the time the biggest political issue for the working class. Um, they were much more interested in, I guess, the immediate circumstances, um, things like, like air and water pollution. Um, and you know having access to, to green space and things like that and um, you also the word ecology um, didn't exist back at that time either but I think Foster makes the point that Engels Engels's approach lends itself towards an ecological way of thinking and actually that 
Engels and other Marxists actually were central to the development of an ecological way of thinking. You know, this idea that humans and nature are all connected as, you know, we're part of nature, that, but it's a, a kind of differentiated unity where, um, it, you know, there's a relationship between humans and nature as well as um, just, just being part of the same thing. It's not a simple kind of holistic approach, it's an ecological approach. So yes, yes, he was one of the first environmental thinkers, that's my answer. It's, uh, it's very interesting because I didn't, I didn't realise that about him um, and it obviously makes me love the man even more. So, yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, we've also got another question. I think this one's to, directed towards you as well, Camilla, uh, it's from Pablo. And it says, can we understand the dialectic on nature in this pandemic times as a negation of negation from nature to us? Um, is it the negation of the negation? Um... Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to think about how you would sort of apply that. I mean, that kind the negation of the negation kind of implies that there's a kind of progress towards an end point. So, is it that we've negated the forests and then the bats have escaped from the forest and now they're going to negate us and lead to some kind of further development within society? Um, yeah, I'm not like I tried to sort of say, I don't, I'm not sure this is that kind of helpful as a way of understanding how the world works. Um, yes. Okay. No I problem. mean, we're not negated by the coronavirus. It's caused no. huge changes in the way we live our society. Yeah. Um, I think much better to look at it in terms of metabolism and metabolic rift as people like, like Rob Wallace have, have done. Okay, no problem. We've got uh, another question here for, uh, I think this one's directed towards Michael. Uh, and the question is, what percentage of capital is invested on financial markets and speculations in comparison with real production? Well, very good statistical empirical question. Um, there are many different ways of trying to measure that. Um, uh, one of the simplest ones is to look at the size of financial profits relative to total profits in the major economies. And what we've seen is that the share of profits that have come from the financial sector uh, have risen from something like 10% of total profits back in the 60s and 70s through the 80s and particularly in the first decade of this 21st century to reaching the point at the, just before the Great Recession in 2007 to 40% of total profits coming from the financial sector. Uh, that's in the US in particular, but the other major capitalist economies also saw a similar process. Also, we could measure another way that the size of uh, the stock market and the bond market relative to total production has also dramatically increased. So that uh, it's several multiples of the size of annual GDP now, the uh, size of the market capitalization, as they call it, the stock market. Um, or the size of bonds being issued, that's loans and so on, by governments and by private sector companies and so on, has also reached high levels. Indeed, the level of credit or debt, however we want to call it, is now, according to the very latest figures, at just under 400% of annual GDP at the moment, from a figure that was less than half that, even just uh, 10 years ago. It's particularly risen since the end of the Great Recession. So what we're seeing is a very sharp expansion of the financial sector, however you measure it, or to more precise in Marxist terms, the expansion of fictitious capital relative to productive capital. And that means that um, if there's any problems with productive capital, because fictitious capital fundamentally, in the end, depends upon the surplus value created from the exploitation of workers in the productive sector. If the productive sector gets weaker, then the, the financial sector is increasingly like a, a tottering house of cards on top of a, of a weakening base, which is the productive sector. And that's probably the reason, in the main reason, I would argue that we had the major slump of the Great Recession of 2008-9. Just to finish on this point, Paul, the, the COVID slump takes a different way, and it's something worth thinking about. The COVID slump has started from a collapse in production because basically everything was closed down. 
uh, either because people had to or the governments told them to do so in the period of the pandemic. Then it led to a collapse in demand because people aren't spending any money, either because they're unemployed, locked at home, or they're not traveling and all the other things that they used to do to spend their money on. So we've seen a collapse in supply and a collapse in demand. What we haven't yet seen, unlike the Great Recession, is a collapse in finance. There's been a massive expansion of the financial assets, the fictitious capital, pumped in from loans provided by central banks. And when the stock market is at record highs as of yesterday, historically record highs in the US and other countries, relative to 10, 5 to 10% fall in GDP for most of major economies. The contrast is dramatic. Uh, that means, in my view, that as we go into 2021, the third leg of this pandemic slump could well be a financial crisis, a collapse of many companies, and perhaps some of the financial sector uh, going into a meltdown. Uh, how that will be resolved is a problem for the capitalist governments, but I can assure you that one thing that will come from this, it will be resolved at our expense, not theirs. Okay, thank you very much for that answer, Michael. We do have another question for you, if that's okay. Um, this is again from Ulysses. And the question is, how do we have to understand the possibilities of radical change in contemporary societies when we think about reform or revolution, specifically with the new left governments, as in Spain or with some countries in Latin America? Well, big political question. Um, obviously, uh, my book and these webinars have been more about the economics of things, but you, nothing is separate from each other. And uh, uh, economics may be what you might call concentrated politics, uh, and the, but out of the economic contradictions comes uh, the political contradictions and the political struggle. And I think Ulysses, as uh, perhaps we should say Odysseus in Greek, uh, has raised the point about what, how will this pan out politically? Well, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer, but he specifically talks about uh, left governments. Uh, for example, he mentions Spain, where we have a coalition of the uh, socialists, the social democrat section of the labor movement, and Podemos, a sort of more anti-capitalist section uh, in coalition against the right wing. Uh, are they in a position to transform Spanish society and the economy uh, during this COVID? Well, it would appear not. They not, haven't got a program that is going to replace the capitalist mode of production to seize the major sectors of the economy and the banks in order to direct them in the interests of social need. They look for ways to try and help people short of doing that. Um, and therefore, in my view, that's a contradiction that cannot be resolved and they will not be able to uh, avoid the slump affecting the vast millions of people in Spain and other countries because they're not prepared to seize the moment to take over the position of power and economic power. So um, I think that's a longish answer. The short answer is that I don't think that uh, the social democratic programs that are being offered in Spain and other countries are going to provide a solution uh, to this pandemic that is not at the expense of working people. And if it doesn't, then working people will take, will take the hit, not capitalism. Excellent answer. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, I think we'll have to leave it there now as we are unfortunately running out of time. Uh, but I would like to thank um, all of our guests today for taking part. Obviously, Professor Stavros Mavrudius, who was in the first section um, of the webinar. Of course, uh, Michael Roberts, thank you very much for taking part. It's been very interesting. And also as well, Camilla Royal, uh, thank you very much for getting uh, for contributing to this. Um, you will be able to watch this again if you missed out any parts on it. It will be on uh, Michael's Facebook page, which is Michael Roberts' blog, and also on the uh, magazine's Facebook page, which is Revista, whoever, the Ali Dad. And also, we'd like to wish happy birthday to the man who inspired this webinar today. Uh, happy birthday to Mr. Engels himself. Yeah. So we'll, we'll raise a drink for him later on. So thank you very much for both taking part, and uh, I wish you every success in the future, and hopefully speak again soon. Bye. Thanks for now. Bye-bye. Yeah.